Our commutes to and from work are often so regular and structured that each day can feel like that never-ending day from that Bill Murray movie, Groundhog Day. That was certainly the case for me in my daily commute from Brooklyn to Manhattan. The only variable was whether I'd be fortunate enough to get a seat one day or not. Most days, the answer was no way. Standing, holding on the rail, rocking back and forth for 45 minutes. That was the journey. So I remember that one particular day going home from work quite clearly. I entered the car just as the doors were closing, and I was delighted to find a last empty seat right there by the door. I sat down to a man hunched over, sleeping. And as the train lurched into motion, I discovered myself slowly sliding off my seat, which of course often happens on the subway, except this subway train was traveling smoothly and slowly. I was momentarily confused until I noticed a constant, steady pressure on my lower back that was pushing me off the seat. I had been wrong, assuming the man was asleep. He was very much awake. It was attempting me to push me off the seat without so much as a word or making eye contact. I didn't say anything either. I just wedged my feet in place on the floor and engaged my quadriceps and applied constant counterpressure. And this silent struggle continued for stop after stop for after stop. 30 minutes later, we're still silently waging this war until eventually another seat opened and I vacated that booby trap seat and left it for the next unwitting passenger. It was a strange experience for sure, but it helped me to notice all of the silent, unspoken struggles that we are a part of our everyday lives. These struggles tend to emerge when we're afraid or uncertain of our footing. We're not quite, when we're not quite clear on what's going on or even who we are. The struggle, I think, comes from fear. And fear is all about us. Anxiety is in the air that we breathe. We're afraid of everything. Afraid of strangers, new situations. We're afraid of being alone, afraid of the dark, afraid of our financial situations. Will that next paycheck cover the expenses? Or will my checking account bounce? We're afraid that our loved ones may get in an accident. And the fear becomes a little questioning voice inside our heads that just won't shut up. What if people see me for who I am? Will I be found out to be a fraud? Will someone steal my identity? What if my true potential is never reached? What if my health is in decline and I'll never get better? What if I die? Fear has this way of leading us to misperceive both threats and opportunities of, by prompting impulsive and sometimes irrational behavior and of narrowing our vision so it's difficult, if not impossible, to see possibility that's before us. Which is why it's hard to be wise or prudent or compassionate when you're afraid. I think that's what's happening in today's gospel story. The disciples are struggling, although it isn't so silent. <laughs> it isn't so silent until Jesus asks them, asks them what, are you, what are you guys arguing about? And the text says it all. They were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another which was the greatest. Right away, the bickering, and right before that bickering, did you notice the disciples do not ask Jesus any questions in response to his pred prediction of his impending crucifixion? Because, as the text says, they were afraid. And the next thing you know, they're talking about securing their place in that coming glorious kingdom. <laughs> Fear does that. It both paralyzes us and drives us to look out only for ourselves. I wonder what Jesus is hoping to teach his disciples. Maybe to point out the fact that doubt is not the opposite of faith, but that fear is. Or at least the kind of fear that paralyzes, distorts, and drives us to despair. But fear is something that we're so afraid of, so terrified of, we sort of deny it altogether. We avoid thinking about it, even when we're feeling it. And so we distract ourselves by playing that same game the disciples do. They distracted themselves with an argument about which of them was the greatest, simply because they couldn't face the fearful reality that Jesus was forecasting. 
They did not understand and were afraid to ask. So they got as far as they could by playing status games instead. Who's first? Who's best? Who's greatest? Who has the most medals? You know what that's like. When you're scared of something, don't ask for help. Just act like nothing's wrong at all. Change the subject. Talk about something else instead. Something that makes you feel big and strong and powerful. Something that you know about that gives you that illusionary feeling of mastery. That's precisely what the disciples are doing. Which is precisely why Jesus has to sit them down and give them a leadership seminar right there and then. He tells them, whoever wants to be first must be servant of all. And he demonstrates by picking up a child. As if to say, you know who's the greatest? Well, it's this child, just 26 inches tall, with a limited vocabulary, unemployed, with zero economic worth. A total nobody. A zero. That's who's number one. Why does Jesus answer the question of greatness with a simple child? What is it about the figure of a child that Jesus wants us to pay attention to? Well, I do think it has something to do with their humble status in life. But I think it's more than that. Just think about it. If I asked you, what do children do? What would you tell me? If you're a parent, you'd say, they ask lots of questions, of course. And boy, do they ask questions. Why is the sky blue? Why do they make the Eiffel Tower? Where does rain come from? Where do I come from? Why do I have to go to school? How long until we get there? Will you leave the light on tonight? Are monsters real? You see, children know about fear. They experience the fear of an uncertain and unknowable future. But unlike us, they don't play possum when they encounter fear. They don't deny it. They're not afraid to show their fear. They're not afraid to ask questions. No, in fact, they ask for help. They're not afraid to be vulnerable and to cry. As such, they're the exact opposite of the disciples. They're the exact opposite of us, too, if we're being honest. They've named their fears, they've asked for help, and in faith, holding on to someone else's hand, they face their fears. Jesus invites us to have that similar sort of faith, a faith that while it might be ridiculed with, riddled with doubt and anxiety, boldly faces our fears. And it all starts when we stop playing possum and acknowledge our own fear. My father-in-law, who is a retired Forest Service work, worker and wildfire fighter, is fond of repeating what he learned in fighting these Western wildfires. Face the danger, he says. Always face the danger. So I think that's what Jesus says to us. Face the danger. Today I want to admit to you that I'm afraid too. As a priest, I fear that our annual giving campaign drive may fall short. I fear that you all won't come back, or those that COVID has scattered will never come back. I fear that maybe I'm not dynamic enough, or loving enough, or attentive enough. I fear that my sermons will fall short. Most of all, I'm afraid that you'll discover that I am afraid. I'm afraid you'll think I'm a fraud. And I could go on listing all the personal fears I have as a son, a father, a husband. It's just a lonely guy. But instead, I want to invite you to join me and to own your fears. What are you afraid of? What makes you anxious? Fear makes us worry about our own security. It makes us compare and compete with our friends and peers. We play that game, Keeping Up with the Joneses, or Who's the Greatest Disciples Play, where we attempt to justify our existence by silently competing with one another. Jesus' response to our fears and our anxieties, however, is an invitation, not to faith in some kind of intellectual assent, as if mentally believing in God somehow prohibits fear, but rather a faith that's based in movement. Faith as just taking the smallest step forward in spite of the doubt and the fear and anxiety. Faith as doing even the smallest thing in hope and trust that God's promises are true for us. 
Know what follows the disciples' fear and Jesus' probing question that only exposes the depth of their anxiety. Jesus overturns the prevailing assumptions about power and security by inviting the disciples to imagine that abundant life comes not from gathering power, but through displaying vulnerability. Not through accomplishments, but through service. And not by collecting powerful friends, but by welcoming children and those other ostracized people. These are the small things when you think about it. Serving others, opening yourself up to another's need, being honest about your own needs and fears. Showing kindness to a child and welcoming a stranger. But they're available to each of us and all of us every day. And each time we make the, even the smallest gesture of faith, that is, we find the strength and courage to reach out to another person in compassion, even when we're afraid, we'll, we'll find that our fear is lessened, replaced by an increasingly and resolute confidence that fear and death do not have the final word, but life and love do. It's time to stop engaging those silent struggles to cover up the fear in your life. Jesus invited us to live abundant life, and it's ours for the taking in our everyday lives. If only we're willing to face the danger and stoop down and greet one as insignificant as a child or as someone as overlooked as perhaps a sleeping man on the train. I often wonder how that train ride may have been different if I hadn't been afraid. What if I'd been secure enough in myself to talk to the man, to ask him questions, to tell, tell him that I saw him? What if I'd paused and just pay, paid attention in a new way? I don't know if it would have changed our interaction at all, but it would have changed me. At the least, I may have saved him from the profanity-laced tongue lashing that he received from the next person that sat down where I'd sat. What would your life look like if you had firm enough footing to face your fears and take simple steps in faith? More importantly, how would your life feel? What would you experience? Jesus came to give us abundant life and abundant opportunities for service so that we might experience that thing that is true life. It's time to wake up from the reactive, fearful struggles and engage in and receive the gifts that God is giving us daily. God is bigger than our fears and our anxieties. God is our opportunity. Amen.